Thanks, Ang, for inviting me and all, all the, um, the uh, committee members. Well, you saying uh, broadening participation in quantitative biology. Well, I, I want to say that I know how to do that. I, know, I have one of the solutions. <laughs> now, um, I, I was a bit nervous to present this solution, but after listening to Dr. Boyd, because he says math is invading biology. Um, but then I, I got a little bit better later on when he said biology needs uh, uh, theories like physics. So I said, okay, maybe that's the problem. They're still only trying to do data analysis. But they don't have theories. So maybe you should change it to math and physics are invading biology. Yeah, instead of just math is invading biology. So maybe math provides the data analysis, physics provides the theories. Because if you're trying to explain something that is natural, that has to involve the laws of physics. So I felt comfortable with the next slide. I'm going to present my solution. I didn't want to engage the physics department. <laughs> <laughs> So that's precisely what the biology department and the physics department did at Spelman. We got together and we said, okay, let's see what we can do. Um, so we came up with transdisciplinary projects, <coughs> projects that extend over several courses. And also in the physics department, we came up with the idea that a problem-based learning, project-based learning that Dr. Boyd said, we conduct the entire course, a physics course and project-based learning, not just a special course designed for project-based learning. And we do that in all our physics courses. So, so we got together and we came up with this transdisciplinary uh, pro pro uh, projects that we are going to try to implement. So that could be one way to attack the problem. If we have so many biology majors, <clears throat> uh, maybe if we engage them earlier in quantitative stuff, maybe we can get, you know, get a handle on this problem, even if we just convert a few of them. So the entire uh, physics department at Spelman is, is committed to project-based learning, committed to quantitative stuff, committed to working with the biology department. And that's, that's very rare. I mean, so five of us, including myself, these are their names. And we all decided that we are going to work together with the biology department to try to increase quantitative reasoning, quantitative skills. So here's the plan for the transdisciplinary project. We decided to start the projects in the biology course. In introductory biology course, we start the projects. Uh, I'll describe some a project, an example later. Then the same project would be uh, what they did in the biology course. They would store electronically, and when they get to the physics course, they would pull that what they did. They would continue the same project <laughs> in the physics courses, and then they would store that, and then they would continue the same project in the appropriate biology, advanced biology course. So what we have done is we have pushed physics in between the introductory and advanced biology courses, sort of a way of building quantitative skills by, by, by seeing a seamless transition throughout the, throughout the three courses. So I'm gonna to try to, 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 to do this quickly because we're running short of time, but let me give you an example of what, what are the sort of things that we did by sort of pushing physics. Now, but before I get to the example, uh, why, why do we think this will work? Well, in the physics department, our interest, interest was how do we get biology majors to pay attention in physics classes? That's really what we were trying to do when we engaged with the biology department. Of course, we didn't want anything to do with biology, but uh, we, 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 um, we joined with them in this, in this effort. Later on, we begin to, to like biology. Now, I never liked biology. I, the last time I took a biology course was in high school. But in engaging with the biology department, I begin to like biology. 
I really like it now. And I, if I had to do it all over again, I might do quantitative biology. But anyway, we started out. How do we show students who are taking the biology, the, uh, the, the physics course, how do we show them that physics and biology are actually on the same page? They work together. They're interdisciplinary. And how do we show them the relevance of physics? Uh, most of them were doing their chemistry homework uh, during the uh, physics class. Well, we, we, we saw the, the, the projects, the transdisciplinary projects would, would, might be a, a way to do this. After we got trying to build these projects, we saw that the projects was richer than we thought. We could actually build scientific thinking, two disciplines working together trying to solve a problem. We could teach them modeling, not just mathematical modeling, but how do you create a model of a biological system? Dr. Boyd spoke about dynamic modeling. So we said, yes, if we start <coughs> dynamic modeling from the very beginning in, in the first biology course, maybe that's a way of broadening participation, getting people interested, seeing how physics can, can play a role. We also got them to, we also saw the possibilities that these projects that are transdisciplinary uh, could deal with real problem solving. Now, when it comes to phys physics courses, they give you problems at the end of the chapter. I don't consider that a real problem solving. That's not a problem. So the real problem solving is trying to cure diabetes. That's a real problem. So if we could get them to start thinking about real problems and how do you come together to solve real problems, then <coughs> that would be a great thing. We also saw this as a way by putting physics in the biology and biology in the physics courses to build quantitative reasoning skills. But then after we've started to build the projects, we saw even greater possibilities. We not, we not only can build these, these uh, scientific skills, quantitative skills, but we can build motivation. Students are now motivated to learn physics, to learn biology, to put them together. We give them authentic experiences. Think about how we do our research. We don't, we don't study all of the theories and then attack the problem. We learn as we go along. We learn what we need to learn to solve the problem. So when we give them a project, they would have to learn the physics required to solve the problem. We don't go through the physics book chapter by chapter. We pull from the chapters as it becomes relevant to solve the problem. So we could build authentic experiences. We could also give them autonomy. They take ownership of their work in projects. One of the reasons that students don't pay attention in the physics class, they don't own the, they don't own the knowledge. They don't see the relevance. They don't. They don't. They think it is, is useless. So we, we're, these projects could build autonomy, give them an independent learning experience, teach them how to how to learn independently. They look upon the professor as a teacher, somebody who is going to tell them what to do, that they are not responsible for their own learning. Projects were able to do this. So what started out as trying to get them to pay attention in physics class by building transdisciplinary projects became richer, started to do, to do all these things. So our hypothesis was that transdisciplinary projects could do all of this stuff. The question now is, how do we implement it? And uh, as I said, engage the physics department, that's the way to solve the problem. It's now been three years and we, we didn't tell you how long it was going to take to solve the problem. But you engage the physics department, you know, but that will eventually solve the problem. So we are making progress. Our hypothesis is that this that the, pro the project-based curriculum would solve all of this. But we still have to learn how to do it. So let me give you an example of one of the projects that we have done. The circulatory system project, developed by, by Rosalind Bass then of the biology department, the Michael Burns car in the physics. So when we develop projects, we put a biology and the physics person together 
to develop the project. So here's the project that we introduced from the very beginning. Create a model of a circulatory system that can be used to predict responses and to investigate problems. This is that dynamic modeling that, uh, that you talked about. So we, we want them to create a model starting from the introductory biology course and to carry it over several courses. And by the time they get to the advanced biology course, they would have a working model. It may not be a physical model, it could be a theoretical model. But that's, our, that's an example of the project. So what is the role of the intro bio, biology course? So we introduced the project in the intro biology course. The role of the intro biology course is to teach them about the phenomenon, the circulatory system. Since we are creating a model of the circulatory system, they need to know the circulatory system. So that's what they do with the intro biology course. One of the things we do in this particular project is to give them case studies like hypertension in the circulatory system, deep venous thrombosis, and I think I said that. Right. <laughs> so we give them these case studies where they would have to say, okay, what is it about the circulatory system that we can that we need to know to, to understand these case studies? In the intra biology course, we actually give them physical tubes, pressure sensors that they can push things through the tubes and they actually start to build the model. We don't engage them quantitatively yet, but it's more qualitative. And in the intro biology course, we introduce concepts that we normally leave for physics, like pressure. Do you know how many students use the word pressure and they don't know what it means? And if we started from the very beginning in the intro biology course, by the time they graduate, they should at least know what it means. They confuse pressure with force, pressure with energy, pressure with all sorts of things. So we, we start that in the intro biology course. Then after they, we, we do these things, they, they um, do a reflection and then they store that for later use in the physics course. Unfortunately at Spelman, the physics course doesn't come the next year. They take the intro biology course in the freshman year, but they take their physics course in the junior year. So it will be two years later that they revisit this, this project. <clears throat> what is the role of the intro physics course? Well, we, we introduce the laws and relationships. The laws upon which I believe the theories of biology will be built in the future. They take the same tubes and now they do experiments, quantitative experiments. They see how the pressure difference varies with diameter, how it varies with length, how it varies with viscosity and various other factors. And they actually take data, fit data, do mathematical modeling as they apply it to the same project that they have been learning about. And then they can even test the project to see, okay, how can I, how can I create hypertension or model hypertension with the tubes? What do I need to do with the tubes to model hypertension? And they can even do that in the, in the, in the physics course. Again, they create a reflection and then they go on to the, to the advanced bio course. Now, we are, since this is the three years that we've been doing this, this is the first semester that we have actually the same set of students that have taken the advanced bio course. But finally, they can put the model together they can uh, investigate the model and apply it to real situations. Okay, this is not that great of a dynamic model that we were talking about, but it gets them to thinking, can we create a dynamic model? Can we actually create it? What are the <laughs> ingredients? How do we build these things? Develop quantitative skills. So here's an example of a, of a, of a project that we have actually started in the intro biology course. Let me give you another project that we have done. I won't go through this in detail. Developed by Michael McGinnix of the biology department and myself. Create a circuit model of a neuron that can be used to investigate various problems such as the effect of a certain toxin. This project was a little bit more challenging because electricity is a little bit more challenging for students. And we, and, uh, but we have actually started this project and done some 
um, work on. I won't go through the details, but that's what we're Now, with this transdisciplinary project that we've done, what have we learned? What are the lessons? What are the challenges? A lot of challenges. The most important challenge is faculty development is essential. <coughs> and when the NSF funds this, they should give a lot of money to faculty development. <laughs> Now, what, what I mean, faculty development is essential. I worked with Gene McGuinness on developing a circuit model of the new, neuron. Do you realize that I didn't know what a neuron was? I'm coming from a hardcore physics background. And if I don't know what a neuron is, how am I going to expect the instructors who I'm passing this model, this curriculum to, and they're teaching it, how are they going to be able to do that? We have to create documents. We have to be able to, to be sensitive to what other people know. If we want to break down barriers to, to broaden participation, we need to break down the barriers in ourselves first. Mm -hmm. We need to broaden our own participation. Say that one more time. <laughs> <laughs> if I can remember. Paraphrase. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we, have to we have to break down our own barriers, broaden our own participation. Um, I chose myself. I was a hardcore physics person. I didn't even give a second thought to biology. But now that I've gotten involved with the biology folks, I'm beginning to like them. <laughs> no, I'm just saying. Derek, um, just as a point of curiosity, how many individuals here have memberships in more than a discipline, uh, in several disciplinary associations? Yeah, so I'm, I'm speaking to the choir here, but for the most for the most part, uh, most of the faculty out there, they really don't know about the others. You may think they do, even the simplest thing. Yeah, you may think they do. Like when I draw a circuit, I, I think that is natural circuit diagram. I, later on, I realized that the biology folks were cringing. They didn't know what it was. I didn't know what a neuron was. I I couldn't. I didn't know what it, what's the difference between a neuron and an axon. It's just, it's just amazing. Faculty development is essential. And it not only, you have to create documents, you have to, you have to be able to create faculty development in many, many ways. One workshop will not do. Typically you give a workshop and then you say, okay, go to it. That's not gonna do it. It has to be a sustained faculty development over several years for them to learn what it is to do interdisciplinary work, transdisciplinary work. You have to have a semester, you may have to meet weekly, you may have to do all sorts of things. Uh, so this is really, really one of the keys. Now, when you're developing transdisciplinary projects, you can't do it in one go around. You have to be able to do it over several rounds, several rounds of, of offering. It takes many, many years. So maybe NSF should ex extend from five years to seven years their project. <laughs> it takes well, several why years. Why don't have a budget in seven years? <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, and it's important that you listen to the instructors, the instructors who are actually offering these um, these, these projects. For example, I, I, we create we had a software that showed the circuit diagrams to, to the intro biology, biology students. We didn't realize that that it wasn't working. The instructor told us that it wasn't working. So what we did after that in the second go around, we uh, we we um, separated the software from applying the software, and sort of tried to make that a little better. So it's very important to have several rounds uh, and to and to and to um, to listen to the instructor. Lots of people are involved get as many people involved as possible. For example, when we do curriculum efforts, we have no idea how to assess them. All I know is hardcore physics. I don't know how to assess educational stuff. Uh, one time I took a picture of a student drawing stuff on the board and an educational person told me, oh, that's very nice, keep that, that's data. Mm -hmm. I turned it. Picture is data. I mean, I don't. 
So I didn't even understand that a picture could be data. Listen, so you need to get educational specialists on board. You need to you need to expand them. You need to you need to have a lot as many people involved as possible. So, so we think about data in certain ways, other people think about data in other ways. Include student reflections. That involves metacognition. That's one of the things that we need to build for the very beginning of students. They need to understand what it means to learn and to, and to, to think about their own learning. So this is very important. And I can say without data, I don't have the data yet, that barriers will break down for some of the students. I heard students come and tell me that they like physics now. I've never heard that in the past before doing transdisciplinary project. I've never heard any student in a biology group, a biology majors come and tell me that they like physics. Now I have a few students coming to me. Now. They don't all like it. A few students are coming and telling me that they like physics. They appreciate it. They can see the relevance. They can see how it fits into what they want to do. They can see how it applies to solving, to curing cancer, curing diabetes. So I said, okay, good. So barriers can break down. And it may take time, but barriers can break down. Not only that, some will appreciate quantitative work. I've seen it. I've seen students appreciate quantitative work. And they, and they actually look forward to doing that. Students who, who, who was weak, weak in, in quantitative work. So by, by putting physics in, in between those two, I think it, it works. Assess with as many instruments as, as possible. <laughs> Collect as much data as possible because you're gonna to need to know, transdisciplinary work is very, very difficult. It requires people in many disciplines and, and things to do. So let me just um, tell you the side of assessments that we, we did. We took pre post questions. We gave knowledge integration questions, which is also important. Questions that requires both disciplines to, to try to, 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 to answer. And a good way that we did the knowledge integration question, we did explanation multiple choice. It turns out that students can answer multiple choice questions for the wrong reasons. So if you give them a multiple choice and then give them another multiple choice where they have to pick the reasons why they chose the first answer, that's called an explanation multiple choice. And that's very useful assessment work. Take attitudes and opinions, standardized test scores like MCAT. Focus groups are very important. Get the feedback from the students <laughs> and student reflections. So that's transdisciplinary work. In addition to the transdisciplinary projects, in the physics department, even not working with the biology folks, we have problem-based learning, project-based learning. And I'm just going to leave you with one of the things that I found very important in project-based learning. Use non-physics problems in the physics course. What a lot of people do is that they 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 give a physics question with a biology context, and they think that is that's interdisciplinary. That's really not interdisciplinary. I'll give you an example. Suppose I were to ask, how much force does a certain muscle exert to lift the leg to the side? Is that a is that an interdisciplinary question? The answer is no, because you're asking a physics question. What I prefer to do in in the projects that I build in the physics courses, I like to ask it this way. Which side do you hold the cane for a bad hip? The side with the bad hip or the opposite side? You have to do the same physics to answer that question as to answer that question. But you have phrased the question now as in terms of a medical question. So they are, they are answering a medical question. They're not answering a physics question. And they begin to appreciate that you need to, to bring in physics to answer this medical question. So when we develop projects, I prefer to develop it this way rather than, than just asking physics questions in other contexts. Anyway, in a nutshell, those are some of the challenges and transdisciplinary work that we're doing here at Spelman. 
There's a lot of people involved, and other than the people that I've mentioned so far, these are the people that are that are involved. Thanks. Okay, at, at Spelman, they, they take that in that order. They, they don't take physics first. <laughs> yeah. Well, if, if they took physics first or took physics at the same time as, as biology, <coughs> then we probably would have to tweak it a little bit. Well, this, this question I've been right? So, um, you start with biology and then you have to give them a couple of years later, you have to give them physics, which actually explains, right, the whole point of that is, is that you can model all the numbers, right? You can build a theory of, of phenomena, which, are, which ultimately is not quite clear, right? So, would it actually make sense to try to have, to redo the program and actually have either physics first or more generally quantitative modeling in the sciences or call it integrated something, I, I really don't yeah. care, right? But the class where don't start with regular biology, but you actually start with with with, with, with an idea that you cannot do regular biology with numbers, and maybe even without numbers. Maybe you start with things like, you know, even explaining uh, the, the, the greatest Nobel Prizes in biology, right? You use Watson, Crick, the Lorenzo, Rose, the Kashyap, Huxley. They are all numbers, right? All three of them have a physicist at the, at the end, right? Uh, so, so maybe that's the right way. Maybe it's just physics first or numbers first is the right way of doing it. Right. I, I, yeah, I'll go along with that. But it's just so much that we, we can push the biology department. <coughs> They're bigger than us. We have more students. But the uh, biggest Nobel Prize in biology is our physicist. Right, right. right. But uh, yeah, I, I would go along with that. You know, physics, at least physics with biology to begin with. When you talk about asking a biological question, to, it, well, there are many, many opportunities when discussing revolution when optical imaging has happened recently. Mm -hmm. Nobel Prize 2014 was for optical imaging technique that didn't exist 20 years ago that you can't understand at all without some physics. It's not a great opportunity that people to buy in and say, okay, I'll pay attention because that's important. Right, right. But yeah, and, and you can tell them these case studies. But what the projects do is it gets it gets them to experience that themselves. That you know they have this authentic experience that they cannot solve the problem 